everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome to our final week of the summer lecture series. I'm David. I'm one of the ministers here and the deacons can come forward as well and, and take up the Sunday school offering. Before we uh, introduce our speaker, there's a pamphlet in your uh, seat that I wanted to just draw attention to. Uh, the Christian Education Committee, both, uh, well, Christian Growth and Nurture and the Christian Education Committees have worked hard uh, all summer and evaluating the last year or so to give you the best Sunday school selection that we can give you. Um, if, if you want to get really connected in the life of the church here at First Presbyterian Church, Sunday schools are probably the best way to do it. This is where people really find their friendships, uh, get connected with other people, fellowship in Christ, and grow in their faith. And so we're looking forward to how that happens in these different uh, Sunday school classes. Uh, on the first page, you'll see all of the different adult opportunities, really starting with the college ministry over in the bridge, to young pros, all the way up to seniors ministry. So there's plenty of opportunities and options for you to get connected uh, maybe the last year or so you haven't quite found that rhythm. We'd love for you to consider what it looks like uh, to find the rhythm of getting connected into a Sunday school class. I promise you'll not be disappointed. Uh, I like to tell our young pros over the last years that community or fellowship, as Dr. Thomas will rebuke me for not using the word fellowship, fellowship is cumulative. It doesn't, it doesn't quite have the ring. Community is cumulative. Uh, if you plug in and plug out every six weeks or so, you just over the long haul, won't find that you have the relationships that the Lord wants to provide for you in the life of the church. And so we'd love for you to jump in. Next Sunday is when we kick off these different Sunday schools on Rally Day. On page two, you'll notice that the opportunities for nursery and elementary and youth uh, are, on, are on page two, and you can figure out where all those folks need to go. I know the nursery and elementary programs are still looking for volunteers, especially in the K-4 in K-5 areas, so if you're interested in serving some of our four and five-year-olds, we'd love to have your help. You can see Hannah Lampman or email her uh, or Beth Greider if you're interested in helping in that way. Also, on September 11th, the next series of the Inquirers class will, will launch. Over the, next, over the last few years, we've had, by God's grace, record numbers coming through and, and being interested in and then joining our church. If you're new here and you want to learn more about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be Reformed, Presbyterian, what it means to be at First Presbyterian Church, we'd love for you to consider that class. David Lawton does a fantastic job with that and, and a couple other folks that help as well. It does not obligate you to join the church, but it's a great way to learn more and to consider what it looks like to invest in the life of the church. If you have any questions on that second page, Dave Von, Vandewater, Clark McNair, and Jack Haynes, or myself, would be happy to help you. And then on the last page is a map. If you still can't figure out where the buildings are in this church, there's a map for you. You can keep it in your Bible and uh, it can travel with you wherever you go. I know I get lost about weekly trying to find my children on campus. Uh, so if you have any questions about Sunday school, we will not be in here next week. We will be scattered throughout the campus starting our Sunday schools at 10 o'clock uh, on the 21st. We're excited to see what the Lord has for us over the course of the next year. Uh, our final speaker for our summer lecture series, the church member's role in, fill in the blank, uh, needs no introduction, and yet you may not know him. He's been gone all summer, <laughs> and if you're new, you may not know him. His name's Dr. Derek Thomas. We're excited uh, to have him this morning to talk about his favorite topic, which is stewardship. <laughs> we got him. We roped him in for a top-tier lecture. Let me pray for him before he comes. Gracious Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity to think about what it looks like to worship you, in particular as we serve you with our time and our talents and our tithes. Lord, you have given us everything for life and godliness. You sent your son, the Lord Jesus, who was rich and he became poor, that we might experience the riches of Christ in him. And we pray, Father, that we would be those who are gracious givers, Lord, out of the gratitude of our own hearts because we have received so greatly from you. Father, convict our hearts and encourage our hearts, Lord, in the ways that we can give of our time and of our talents and of our tithes over the coming years, that you might be glorified and that you might build your church to the ends of the earth. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you. Having been, having been gone uh, all summer, and if you're visiting uh, with us today, I should explain uh, that the session kindly gave me a two-month sabbatical uh, in June and July. I realized back in March that uh, all of the speakers that I'd invited for the summer lectures uh, were speakers of, how do I put this, of such significance uh, that I felt obliged to ask them also to preach. And it, in March or so, I realized I wasn't going to be preaching in June and July um, at all. And uh, I wanted to write a book uh, on the life of Peter. Uh, I had videoed um, a teaching series for Ligonier earlier this year, January, February of this year, but they were, they were just little 20-minute segments. Some of you are familiar with those teaching uh, series. Uh, and, but I wanted to have a book to go along with it. Uh, and uh, I wrote it. I wrote it in three and a half weeks uh, over the summer. That, that doesn't sound quite as um, momentous as, as, I, as, I, as it came out. Um, a, lot of it, a lot of it was already prepared, but, but uh, that's been sent off to the publisher. And uh, I uh, did have some vacation time uh, with my grandchildren in Scotland, and we went on a a little boat to Norway, uh, Rosemary and I, for a week, which was wonderful. It's a bit like um, Alaska. The coastline was a very reminiscent of Alaska, and that was refreshing. And then, then I'm back. And uh, did I think about retirement? Oh, yes, I thought about <laughs> retirement. Uh, but I'm not quite ready to retire yet, and there are some things that I want to see accomplished um, and I'm in uh, touch with several elders about that narrative, and, uh, but it's not anytime soon. So whether that's good news or bad news, just keep it to yourself. Um, uh, I'm now married to a woman who's older than me uh, as of yesterday. It happens every year, I'm married to an old woman. And uh, she's actually not here this morning, so I can, I can, I can get away with saying that. Um, if you're new to the church, and, and it's quite possible that you are, we've had a, a lot of, uh, we've had 200, 250 new members in the last, since COVID. Uh, and every morning, every Sunday morning, I, I shake hands with people and I think, who are these people? Uh, and they're visiting uh, from, uh, from here in the city. And, uh, but if you are new and you just happen to be here, uh, every summer we have these lectures, um, June, July, and, and the first half of August, and there are 12 or 13 of them. Uh, and there, there's usually a theme, but the last one today has for the, for the last few years been on stewardship. Every, every church has a stewardship season, small churches, big churches, have stewardship season, and it's in the fall sometime, but, but we felt, um, or, or I say we, l let, me, let me describe to you how this church works. Um, you know, I, I have a certain amount of input into the life of the church, but it's, it's, it's fairly small and minuscule. Um, th this church represents a very old and traditional understanding of the role of ruling elders. It's a southern phenomenon um, going back to the times of uh, James Henry Thornwell for sure, uh, who had a very, very distinctive view of the role of the ruling elder. And at any one time, uh, we, we now have, uh, at least this year, we will have Lee 48 elders. Uh, we used to have 40, but we've increased it incrementally over the last four years to 48 sitting elders. Now, we have probably have 100 elders, all told. But at any one time on session, there are 48 elders. And, and really, it is the session that ultimately makes decisions 
as to how this church is governed and it makes decisions about um, the course. I, I, can, I can influence that to some degree. Some of the other pastors can influence that to some degree. But it, but it is a session-led church. And uh, we have, in these last few years, um, designated this last summer lecture to the issue of stewardship. Now, every senior minister that I know is not a fan of the stewardship sermon. Uh, it's, a, it's a necessary thing, but, um, and it's not a plea for money. Uh, we are an extraordinarily blessed church. I, I say that with absolute sincerity. We are very, very blessed at First Columbia. Uh, there are churches uh, who are uh, under budget by this time of the year, and I've been uh, on staff in a church where in December um, they were under budget uh, by to the tune of maybe a couple of million dollars, and, and there, was, there were phone calls and letters and, and, and uh, pleas from the pulpit and so on that had to be made in order to um, reach that budget. We, we are never there. So if you're visiting, um, I want you to know that we, we rarely talk about money uh, at First Press, and that's an enormous blessing. As I, as I now speak, we are significantly ahead of our budget for this year. That, that's, how, that's how generous uh, our congregation is. Stewardship is more than about money. It's a recognition that we are stewards. In other words, all that we have is a gift of God. And stewardship involves typically three things. Time, talent, and tithe. You have gifts. You have extraordinary gifts. You have gifts that I don't have. Um, this church is filled with people with gifts. And we need those gifts. And we need them utilized uh, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. I want to take you this morning briefly to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Uh, it, it's too long a passage to read. Uh, I can, let me tell you something of the context. Paul spent two, two and a half years of his life in a capital campaign in um, Asia Minor and Greece and elsewhere uh, raising funds for a, a particular project. And the particular project was poverty relief in Jerusalem. Now you understand that the church in Jerusalem was largely made up of converted Jews. And in the late 30s and early 40s and, and early 50s, um, as these Jews and now Jewish Christians um, declared their faith, it became more and more difficult for them to survive in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, their businesses would be boycotted. Um, and m most of the city of Jerusalem, at least most of the early church, tended to be relatively poor, living... Um, from week to week. They weren't people with inherited wealth or, or anything like that. And, and as their businesses were boycotted, um, and in addition to that, a, a famine that beset um, uh, Judea and, and affected Jerusalem, um, Paul, and, and maybe for political reasons too, integrate the largely Gentile churches that he was planting with the largely Jewish Christian church, the mother church in uh, Jerusalem. In order to um, integrate those, uh, one of the things that he, he saw that was necessary was to help them financially 
uh, get through this period of famine. And so he, was, he is raising money in the churches of Macedonia uh, up in the north and, and the churches uh, in, in southern Greece that would include um, Corinth and, and Athens and, and, and others. And this uh, project lasted for upwards of maybe two, two and a half years um, and uh, it, it probably didn't accomplish the political end that Paul might have had in mind. But here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he, he addresses that. This is not about the weekly tithe. It's not about weekly giving. This was a, this was a special project. But there are principles here that apply for our day-to-day -day living as Christians in a local church. Well, let me, let me pick it up in uh, 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. This, this Macedonia is up in the north. So it, it, it's like Paul is saying, look, I want you to know how generous the Yankee churches have been. And I think, I think he's actually goading them. You, you, you don't want these northern churches in Macedonia to outgive you. It's a play. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Now, let me pause there. And uh, the, this issue covers uh, the entirety of chapters 8 and 9, and Paul is giving uh, principles of stewardship. So these uh, northern churches in Macedonia, uh, you notice in verse 2, um, they gave generously, generously, over and above. This is an extraordinarily generous church. It's a privilege for us as ministers to serve here. We're not serving under constraint. Um, there are acts of generosity I, I want you to know that I don't know at all what anyone gives. I, I make that a principle. Uh, there are two or three people uh, in the office uh, who deal with that. Um, and um, I think apart from one of them, uh, they're actually not members of this church. But I, as an act of principle, do not know who gives and what people give. I, I don't want to know that, that information. So I'm not privy to that. But every now and then, there have been times when there have been special requests. Uh, Easter offering would be an example. Um, the deacon's fund would be an example. Uh, every now and then, there's a, just a unique case of someone who's in um, considerable difficulty. And, and I just have to write a letter. That's all I have to do. I simply have to mention it in someone's ear, and, and, it, and it comes in, just like that. Um, you, are, you are generous people, um, and it's a blessing uh, to work and, and, and serve here. You notice in verses 12 and 13, for if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what 
he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. And Paul is talking about a principle of proportionality. Proportionality. Some people have more than others. Uh, some, some of our folks live uh, on a very meager income. Uh, but others, uh, others have much. And, and Paul says, uh, it's not a matter of exacting from people um, what isn't fair. Fairness, proportionality, according to what you have and not according to what you don't have. And notice in verse 5, uh, and this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. What is stewardship? Stewardship is an understanding that we, we belong to the Lord. And everything that we have belongs to the Lord. And we are stewards of it. it it's not ours. We are Christ's. And he may do with us as he pleases and wishes. It's a principle of sacrifice. Putting God first. That's why I love this church. It's one of the reasons why I wasn't moved to retire because um, this is a church that puts God first. Stewardship is not a tax. Taxes are coming. You need to do something about it. <laughs> we may be heading for some difficult times. Inflation at 8.5% or whatever it happens to be. And, and there may be some, some rough waters ahead for a year or two. At this moment, we are way over budget to the tune of maybe half a million dollars. That's incredible. That's a, an enormous blessing. You notice if you turn to chapter 9 and verse 7, he talks about giving cheerfully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There are lots of needs. We need volunteers. Children's ministry needs volunteers. I, I, I learned this week that it takes 50 volunteers to run our Sunday school, our young children's Sunday school, 50 volunteers. That could be your ministry. That could be something you could do for the Lord. We need Sunday school teachers. Our college ministry is one of the great uh, aspects of, of First Columbia. Um, when I first came here, there was virtually no college ministry. Uh, but it's an, it's an extraordinary blessing on a Sunday morning to go into the college room pop your head around the door and see upwards of 40 or 50 college students learning scripture, loving one another. And college students need food. <laughs> the, 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 the first principle of college ministry is food. You feed them. And uh, those, those Presbyterian casseroles with mushroom soup, cans of mushroom soup, and uh, they are the staple diet of college ministry. But somebody needs to make them. You, you need to ask yourself, perhaps, what can I do? And we're hoping to get better on uh, uh, our communications. And, and we have a wonderful girl uh, who now works on communications that has improved it 100%. Um, but there will be opportunities that you, you can go to the church app and, and, and go to a section on 
volunteering. What, what can I do? And there's all sorts of things that you can do. We, we hire staff, and in this last year, uh, we've taken on at least three new members of staff. We are at the point where the bridge is now uh, becoming, um, uh, office space is becoming difficult to find. And, and that's, a, that's a good problem to have, but it's a, it's a problem that's facing us in this year and, 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 and the coming years for sure, and we will have to address that. And there are, there are some others. I asked some of the directors uh, of some of our ministries uh, to provide for me a wish list. You know, what, what would you like to see if, if we could afford it? Now, uh, how does First Prayers work? And we work like most churches work with a budget. And there's a process. And that process begins right now and it'll go through the fall and, and uh, each department will come up with uh, a, a wish list and, and, and a cost um, and it'll come to a, a certain figure, uh, and sometimes that figure is greater than the pledging. You ask yourself, what is pledging? And pledging is uh, a commitment that you make, God willing, uh, to provide X amount of dollars in the course of next year from uh, whatever uh, resources God has given to you. About half our members, um, well, not members, we think of pledging units. And by pledging units, it could be a single person, it could be a married couple, it could be a married couple with, with eight children, uh, it could be a retired couple. And, and, and so there are pledging units. But of those pledging units, about half of them pledge. And the other half give uh, without pledging for a whole variety of reasons. When that pledge figure comes in, we add to that pledge figure an estimate as to how much non-pledged giving we can expect in the coming year. And it comes to roughly about $2 million. Some of that is loose offering and some of that is gifts that people give, uh, but it isn't pledged. But it, it's roughly around $2 million. So our budget um, is approximately $7 million. That's not pocket change. That's a lot of money. And it needs to be used widely, wisely. But sometimes um, the budget for next year, for example, might exceed the pledge plus an estimate of what that loose giving and unpledged gifts might be. And, and so the, the budget has to be trimmed. It was a difficult process last year, for whatever reason. And some department's wish list had to, be, had to be cut a little. It couldn't be done. That's, that's the challenge. And it's difficult for me as a senior minister in a church that is exceedingly generous to say, maybe, maybe you this is something that you could pray about and think about. And especially in a year where we're all facing the challenge of uh, uh, the Inflation Deflation Act or whatever it's called. Uh, and and, and it, it's going to be difficult perhaps and for all of us. And therefore, the sacrifice part might be something that rises uh, more to the surface. Um, we need volunteers. We would like, if possible, to hire um, a few more staff in children's ministry, in college ministry, in young professionals ministry. These are important areas in the life of the church because if you can capture children and disciple them, if you can capture college students and disciple them, if you can capture young professionals and disciple them for three years, four years, five years, the reward 
will be significant. 10 years from now, 15 years, 20 years from now. So you're investing in the future of First Press. When, when I'm long gone, I'll just be a memory. At least I hope I'll be a memory. During the course of this year, as an example of uh, uh, generosity and sacrifice, uh, the bridge was paid off in full. That was a project that started, Lee, sorry to pick on you because you're the only one I can see, but it was started eight years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago. And, and, and we bought it for $4 million. It was too much, but, it, but none of us regret buying it. We renovated it. It cost another $4 million. It was too much, but none of us regret it now. But it's all been paid off. The loan was paid off in full. And actually, we have a surplus. Maybe I shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> the, the, we, we, we brought in more than, than we needed, but we're going to use that for some repairs, necessary repairs and improvements. Um, taking on new staff means that we have to, have to think outside the box to create some new offices and so on. But every day when I walk into the bridge, I remember I used to walk into Palmer it's like night and day. I mean, that, that building is functional, but that's all it is. There's nothing about it that is aesthetically pleasing. It's functional. But the bridge is beautiful. I remember having a conversation with Ken Wingate, who's here somewhere. With Ken Wingate. Um, about having a coffee shop on the first floor. And I thought, what? First Prayers is not a coffee shop sh church, <laughs> you know. Alistair Begg's church in Cleveland has a beautiful coffee shop. And I've been there, and I've tasted the coffee. And I thought, that's great. And when you walk in and in the mornings, maybe after lunch, and there are a dozen college students. They spend the day in the coffee shop. They, they work there with their laptops, and they talk, and they fellowship, and they grow in love with our church. And, and it's, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a beautiful seed that grew into something that was even more Beautiful. We have, we have some desires. We, we would love to give more to world missions. It's central to Jesus' plan, going to all the world and make disciples. The Great Commission, the, the last thing that he said before he ascended. And first, Prez has a lively and, and invigorating um, church mission, uh, foreign missions um, emphasis. And the Frank Hill Center, um, and there's a group of you especially that are devoted to foreign missions, and it's a beautiful thing. But we would like to see a little more of our budget you know, you have to pay for electricity and utilities and, and, and staff. A lot of our budget is staff. You pay me, thankfully. Thank you. But we would like to see incrementally over the next few years the amount of giving to missions, foreign and local missions, to increase to a, 
a certain percentage of our budget, and that, and that has to take place incrementally. But that's a goal. We would like to see that. Um, the youth ministry and college ministry. Um, college ministry would like to see um, Bibles being given to um, college students who are on the periphery of the Christian faith. They may not even possess a Bible. They may never even have read it. But they've been invited along and they, they've, they've enjoyed the fellowship and the camaraderie and the friendship. And uh, they would like uh, to see in their budget uh, a line item for um, Bibles. Mm, wouldn't be a huge sum, but it's, it's something that isn't there just now. I, I, don't, um, I don't influence the session a lot. I don't think I do. It's not, I, 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 that's not my, my um, modus operandi. I put thoughts in elders' ears every now and then. Um, but I did this year write a letter to the session. And I said, it's time for us to consider uh, church planting again. Grace is 10 years old. It's strong, thriving. We heard last week all about it. God has richly blessed that church plant. Not all church plants are successful. And not all church plants are as successful as grace has been. And that's all the Lord's doing. But it's, it's time to consider a church plant. You know, if all of our members attended on Sunday, we don't have room for them. Now, that's not a, an excuse for you not to come. Um, but... If all of our members actually attended, we, we, we don't have room for them. And I think it's time for us to reach out. And uh, the session agreed, and uh, Ken Wingate is the chair of uh, uh, a committee that's looking into church planting. C can, I, can I say a little more about that? About there's a possibility. It, it's, it's, it's only a possibility. It's, it's an act of providence that was unforeseen that we may end up planting two churches. It's a possibility. Perhaps in Lexington, perhaps in Casey, where the population is expanding. When, when Grace was planted, we sent, I think we sent 100 members to grace, uh, half of them stayed, and, and I think half of them roughly came back. But they were necessary for a, for a season. And we could do that. I, I think it's vital um, for Colombia to have strong, healthy churches. It'll do Colombia good to have strong, healthy churches. And as other churches lose the narrative and succumb to the woke culture that we're in and lose their path and abandon the integrity of Scripture. It's right to plant a new church, faithful church, committed to the Scriptures and to the Gospel. And uh, uh, that may take a year, two years, three years to actually accomplish. But that committee is now up and running and they're discussing and they're talking. That would be a stewardship. And maybe next year we'll be, we'll be asking you, can, can you see yourself giving of yourself and your family? Maybe for a season and, and, and maybe for the future to a new church. Help grow it in the Lord. Make that your prayer. Think about it and pray about it over these coming um, months. And I'll be giving you more 
information as that information uh, comes about. Time, talent, and tithe. That's what stewardship is about. But it first of all comes from a relationship to the Lord. I am God's. Everything about me is His. I am not my own. I am His. Lock, stock, and barrel. And so whatever I give back to the Lord, I do so because I'm a steward. That's all I am. Thank you for your generosity. Truly. It is such an honor to be part of a church where um, giving is, is not an issue. We just, we're just dreaming about maybe doing more than we're doing now. That's all it is. It's a dream. But it's a good dream. And God willing, maybe we can accomplish for the Lord uh, more than we're actually doing right now. And that, that would be an act uh, over and above and beyond uh, in generosity. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of belonging to First Columbia. You have blessed us. You have given us wealth and talent beyond measure. There are folks in this room this morning who are extraordinarily gifted in so many ways and for, through whose ministries uh, the church has solidified and grown. But we dream this morning of becoming perhaps something even more. This city needs a strong church that is committed and faithful to the scripture and to the gospel. And above all else, we pray for grace to remain faithful to you. There are all kinds of pressures all around us. And we ask for faithfulness and courage to stay strong and to be firm and to endure in the midst of opposition and hostility. For your glory and all of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.